So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, this is Robin Norgren and I'm your host for Creativity Montessori and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on my links over on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for Life. These words are from a book called Save by a Poem by Kim Rosen. John twenty one eighteen. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. Choosing a poem to be your companion and guide is a mysterious process that does not usually submit to your mind's agenda. Often are the times I have encountered a poem I thought I should get to know, for a workshop I'm about to give, for a friend's wedding, for a presentation with a colleague who wants me to read a sonnet I don't really like. Sometimes I've tried to use verses for prideful reasons, to win over a new lover with a few succulent lines of Neruda, or to impress a poetry teacher with a recitation of Dante's divine comedy. It never works. Either I end up discarding the effort, or I succeed, but the poem does not truly root in me. Within a week, I will have little memory of it. On the other hand, I find myself absorbing, with gusto, poems that are of no use at all to my hungry ego. Poems I may never have an opportunity to offer to another person. Reading long sections of T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets every night just before sleep until the music of the words is singing through my dreams or learning Dr. Seuss's happy birthday to you by heart in its entirety, which takes 10 minutes to deliver. There is an uncanny inner guidance that compels the poems that I take into my life. You can trust the poems you are drawn to. They hold a medicine for your life, whether you know it or not. Sanja had no idea that Whitman's long loping lines would counteract with the frenetic intensity of the factory. Yet she followed an unnameable, seemingly irrational urge to immerse herself in leaves of grass and found that the rhythms and images were exactly what she needed to open her heart in the harsh world of the assembly line. Getting to know a poem is entering into a relationship. And, like developing any relationship of substance, it asks for commitment and focus. This does not mean hard work. It does not mean painstaking discipline. It does not mean, as poet Mary Oliver says, walking on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert. It means, again in Oliver's words, letting the soft animal of your body love what it loves. It requires about the same amount of discipline as becoming a connoisseur of chocolate, or exploring the intricate auditory landscape of a piece of music that makes your heart sing. These endeavors do require focus, but the focus is a natural companion to pleasure and curiosity. When a poem touches you, these arise spontaneously. Poems attract you for all sorts of reasons. Some, like those described in other chapters, are medicine for difficult times. Perhaps they offer a clear message that speaks directly to the crux of a soul need, as Invictus did for Guy Johnson, or Phenomenal Woman did for C.C. Carter. Perhaps they bring the vibration of a brighter, truer life, 
as Leaves of gra Grass did for Sanja in the car factory. Maya Angelou, Carl Upchurch, and Hind were not seeking specific messages from the poems they immersed themselves in. Rather, it was the essential beauty and wisdom of the verses that attracted them and powerfully counteracted their traumatic ex experiences. In the darkest of times, I too have turned to poems for help, for comfort, for affirmation of my inspirations and dreams. They have held me like wise elders, reminding me of who I am and what really matters. Some thoughts from a book called Taking Flight by Kelly Ray Roberts. Joan Chittister says, it's only what we learn while we're doing what seems to be basically routine that really counts how to endure, how to produce, how to make life rich at its most mundane moments. For years, I wondered why my older sister named her creative business Sacred Cake. I would densely ask, Sacred Cake, I don't get it. It took some years of stumbling through my 20s to emerge on the other side with a view and an understanding that there is indeed simple beauty in everything. Everything, including seemingly ordinary things, like the falling of leaves, the sweetness of words, the glorious changing of seasons, and yes, even cake. Brilliant. It has likely been one of my greatest lessons learned in life. And it came from my older sister, whose work and wisdom you can see online. She not only appreciates the details of everyday life, things you and I might pass over as forgettable, but she also finds the sacred in everyday materials that might otherwise go unnoticed or be thrown away. She takes these very items and turns them into glorious, meaningful art. So what exactly does finding the sacred and the ordinary have to do with a creative life? Everything. 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 Finding the sacred in the everyday details not only expands our personal gratitude for every ounce of the world's offering, but it fuels our creative expression. Once we learn to seek simple beauty, we find ourselves surrounded by inspiration that, when collected inside moments of seemingly insignificant details, expands our creative voice. We see things where we didn't see them before. We pay attention. We get inspired. Suddenly the sky isn't just the sky. Instead, it's full of shades and shapes we didn't stop to pause and notice before. Beauty that may inspire a new project idea. Even raindrops, as my friend Nina has taught me, aren't just raindrops. Instead, they are bubbles of rainwater that, if looked closely upon, reveal a mirror image of their surroundings. How beautiful! Just like the raindrops inside the casing of our everyday lives are small, sacred wonders waiting to be noticed and waiting to spark our creativity. Just as Raoul Venegan reminds us, there are more truths in 24 hours of a man's life than all the philosophers. For me, one of the ways I find beauty and truth in the ordinary is by taking photos of my everyday happenings of my small discoveries along the way. Some days I snap photo after photo of treasures I find on my daily walks. The way the sun is setting, reminding me of the birth of possibility and inspiring me to use more yellows and pinks in my paintings. Old doorways signifying so much in their distressed beauty. My feet and shoes representing literal steps in the journey of life. I also capture images of heart shapes found in leaves and rocks and wood grain. To me, they represent small and meaningful speckles of universal loveliness and meaning. 
All of this photo taking inspires me to think about how I express my creativity to the world. The colors I am drawn to, the aesthetic I want to capture. It's all right there in my daily life. I just have to pay attention and ordinary things suddenly become anything but. How about you? Perhaps you're a photographer already in tune with capturing the small wonders of the everyday. Is there anything you may be missing in the details? Or perhaps you're a mother whose camera has been stashed away like the china, only coming out for special occasions. What about the special occasion that is today? Perhaps this week you could challenge yourself to carry your camera everywhere. Take a photo of anything and everything that calls to you. Your child's colorful stockings, your favorite pair of shoes, the way the light falls onto your skin, the flowers that bloomed in your garden today. Pay attention to colors and textures and form and keep them tucked inside your creative mindful toolbox. You will be transformed at how much you see and discover. The idea is that these little discoveries will expand your creative vision Perhaps have you thinking of new ideas, new projects, new color combinations and texture. By the way, this is a great opportunity to start that blog or the Whisper Evidence Journal or Sacred Things Scrapbook as a way to document your findings. It will help you remember to keep looking, paying attention, and celebrating the beauty of the details. Your creative spirit will thank you. In my book, Your Creative Peace, Find and Deepen Your Creative Voice While Communing with God, I documented an interview with an artist named Erin Lee. The name of her business is Art by Erin Lee, and her creative influences are Michelle Allen, Carla Sondheim, Tisha Moore, Pam Garrison, Kelly Ray Roberts, Sarah Ahern. Her preferred medium of creativity is mixed medium, which is paint, paper, charcoal, pastels. Erin Lee is a mixed media collage artist, which means she uses paper, paint, pastels, markers, and anything she can find to create. She says, I create rich texture and color with quotes and scripture that encourage me daily. My hope is that my work will do the same for you and your family. I believe that we are all born with a gift that is meant to be used and given away. It is pure joy to have discovered this gift and to trust that God will use it for his glory. In being able to create and provide for my family, I am living a dream for which I am unspeakably grateful. I create all of my work in my little room at home while chasing my children, teaching kindergarten part-time, and figuring out cheap and healthy meals to cook for my family. What is one of your earliest creative memories? Spending countless hours in the fourth and fifth grade perfecting my bubble letters and doodling endlessly. Did your creative habits make a smooth transition into your adult life? I have spent my life putting off creating art, knowing that it was a part of me, but not making time or space for it in my life. In high school, I took foreign languages and AP classes instead of the, the art I wanted to take in order to get into the college I wanted to get into. In college, I wanted to major in art, but I was steered towards something more practical, something I could make a living doing. Little did I know that thousands of people make their living in art-related careers every day. But I am really thankful that I took the path I did. I would have loved to go into full-time ministry, be on the Young Life staff, but the thought of raising my own support overwhelmed me. So I did the next best thing. I became an elementary school teacher, a career, passion, and calling that I could not be more grateful for. For 10 years after college, I was focused on being the best teacher I could be, traveling all over the world, 
working with Young Life Ministry as a volunteer leader. My life was full, and while I felt the pains and callings of art, I still never made the time and space for it in my life. Ironically, it wasn't until I was pregnant with my son that I picked up some canvases and paint and started creating things for my son's room. I finally had time, a whole summer off, and space. Our house had a whole room for me to play in. My studio is still my dream come true. When I finished creating everything I could possibly create for my baby's room, I didn't want to stop, and so I didn't. I just continued to paint and paint and paint. Then I stumbled across Somerset Studio Magazine in Barnes & Noble, and I knew I had found my calling, mixed media collage. I started playing and never stopped. The most important lesson I've learned is to keep moving forward in baby steps. The whole art thing can be very overwhelming. If you only look at how far you have to go, or if you start comparing yourself with other artists, you will always fall short. The key for me has been simply the next baby step. What is the small thing I need to do next? First I painted, played, and experimented with a bunch of collages. Then I approached several coffee shops and got them displayed. I was shocked when some of them sold. For much too little, but what a thrill. I really couldn't believe it. I'd entered several more art shows. Then I set up an Etsy shop. It took three months for me to sell my first piece. I forgot that I even had a shop. With lots of trial and error and research through Google, I started to make and sell more. Against my will and at the advice of other artists, I created a, a blog and connected with other artists, which has been ultimately pure joy. Eventually I submitted pieces and articles to Somerset Magazine. Having them published had been a dream come true. Truly more than I ever thought possible. Attending Art Fest and Art Retreat changed my life more than anything. I realized these people that I had been idolizing over the internet were simply people. That's it. They just made a decision to make art and it wasn't until then that I knew, I really knew, that I could live this artful, creative life too. Even today, I get really overwhelmed by things I could do or want to do and by how far I have to go. But I have always go back to my baby steps. What is the next doable step? How has God been a part of your creative process? This creative life has been a pure gift to me from God. It has breathed new life in me and introduced me to a part of myself that I had never known. Not just the artist's self, but the start your own business self as well. Who knew I had it in me? Only God. At first I clutched it tightly, afraid that he would take it away. And little by little I'm learning to surrender my art to God and allow him into the process to lead me and guide me. The book Finding Divine Inspiration by J. Scott McElroy helped me to let go of my art, to give it back to him, and to let him in. It takes effort and practice to invite God into the process, but I am learning that it is much more gratifying and peace-bringing with God in charge instead of me. To be on this creative journey with him, being led by him, and knowing that he knows the way is a thrill and a joy. Is there a particular moment where your creativity became infused into your spiritual practice? No, in my ideal life, I have a daily quiet time and art journaling time where I can read God's word, listen to him speak to me, and create in my art journal. But right now, working full time and raising children, my art time usually comes late at night in bits and pieces. My quiet times are on my way to work, to lunch, or on my way home.